The phenomenon of art market we particular attention to the increasing correlation between practices of art market and social economic dynamics from the perspective of recognizing a possible formulation of the economic value of art market the impacts which art market is having in some urban context where the regeneration processes have found in this new form of re-signification and innovative modality of intervention. Some impacts have economic nature, direct, indirect, or inducted. Others are only social and cultural, starting from concerning the impacts of art market sustainability in several urban contexts and evaluation of what is happening in some neighborhoods of the metropolitan city. Let's put it this way. The power of knowledge and access is growing. Emerging art markets by curating seminar art was drawn from the private collection along a historical narrative in an alternative space accessible to the public. Good afternoon. You are tuning in the Midday Show with Stephen Poon. I'm your host for this episode 16 of Spotlight Dialogue series. Once again, in the virtual room with me are the regular team of the Special Interest Group in Circular Economy from Integra Integrated Sustainability and Urban Creativity Center, according as ISUC, also known as ISU, at Asia Pacific University of Technology and Innovation, APU. It's live on Facebook now and live on YouTube too. We have a great staff on a little surprise. I'm very excited because we have planned to share today 
Before we get to all of that, let's start on the topic: the effect of showing art in the public realm on art market sustainability. Our guest today, Zena Kang, a contemporary art curator and writer whose practice shines a light on emerging art markets, a specialist in Malaysian contemporary art. She is a curator of the AFK collection and produces. And, um, produces art knowledge via exhibition publications and engagement with digital platforms. In 2020, Zena co-founder Dua Consultasi, an art consultancy born from a desire to create growth in Malaysia art ecology through a mix of the curated exhibition, art talks, and specialist sales. Zena has uh, curated several international art exhibitions, including Open House, Delfina Foundation London in 2017, PASS, Battersea Power Station London in 2018, and Homing Inn Arts Council England in 2021. International art correspondent for the, for the, for the curator Mac, Zena contributes to several publications, including Harbour Bazaar, Bureau 24-7, and The Art Link. In 2019, Zena guest edited Bazaar Art and was an invited writer for the inaugural Malaysian Pavilion and Venice Biennale. Please welcome Zena Kang. Hi, Stephen. Hi, Zena. How are you doing? You're looking good today. Oh, thank you. How are you? I'm okay. And the weather is not good. It's a bit down and a bit breezy, but I think it's okay, especially come to the weekend. How have you been doing? I heard that you are not feeling well. So how are you doing today? Oh, you know what it is? is I've been I've been traveling. I just got back from a, from a trip to Venice for the Venice Biennale. Um, oh, that's very nice. You okay? It was nice. And then I went to oh, Paris, yeah. um, which is actually a personal vacation, a birthday trip, but I managed okay. to get a really great... Um, Happy birthday to you, Zena. But you know, <laughs> I saw a bunch of museums, you know, the museums mm. in Paris are amazing. I stayed mm. across the road from the Louvre. Um, I had the Pinot collection up a block to my right. You know, okay, it's that's very nice. Yeah. yeah. Historic art, contemporary art, public art, private collections. Paris yeah. has everything. That was wonderful. I, I, I love to go to yeah. I really love to go to Venice again. I haven't been traveled to that side of the world for almost, I think, ten, 10 years because after I returned, the last time I was there, there was I think really um, there was an early, uh, two thousand. I think two thousand two, two thousand three. I was there once. I couldn't remember yeah. which that, but I went there for this kind of festival. That everyone put on the mask, uh, dress up the costume, really really nice, especially this yeah. uh, during this uh, late spring time. Yeah. Yeah. It's really fun. And you're just to say, I mean, and I feel it's really connected to our conversation. That's one of the things that I found so interesting mm. about Venice. <laughs> is that it's okay. got all of these kind of um, public or community kind of festivals. You've got the Venice Biennale, the film festival mm -hmm. was on when I was mm -hmm. there. You mentioned mm -hmm. the Masquerade Festival. Um, the city mm. itself really comes alive with this kind of international crossroads of culture, which has mm -hmm. always historically been the DNA of Venice. You know, it Historically, mm. it's a city for merchants and trade, and um, to see how that's been translated in the contemporary context is really mm. very exciting and very interesting. I felt, and yeah, I think the, I think that there's a different type of the art market over there as well, and uh, not just only Venice itself, but it's also the entire European continent, and also British arts, you know, has a different way how they approach art market as well. Yeah. I think this is the topic for today for the art market, especially uh, we are talking about this uh, over another side of the world, which uh, we are here in Southeast Asia. So it's going to be a different perspective as well. Okay, uh, Zena, let's uh, set the scene before we get into that. Generally, for art markets, uh, the monetary valuation methods of environmental externalities are based on the econom uh, econometric analysis of market prices, mm -hmm. starting from the principle that the price of the market is affected, among other things, by the quality of the business environment. From yeah. this perspective, art <coughs> can be understood as a positive externality for its capacity to re-evaluate degraded areas and therefore is able to affect the market. So, Zena, how can the impacts of art on market prices be measured? 
you know that's that's such an interesting question and i think it's um it's quite broad ranging your question and I, that's why i find it interesting because we think of art as quite a singular and tight entity or concept whereas its effects are really broad ranging um i'd like to actually point out in in terms of what you're asking which is like what is the impact of art on kind of broader economies on the market how can it affect um you know other things within the market as we understand it in economic terms um i think of property i think of you know wages etc and in that sense i'd like to actually point to the idea of the global alpha city which is that um you've got cities that are coming up mostly in emerging areas you know dubai the middle east you know even singapore like they're, they're not the traditional centers of um power and commerce when you think of like new york or london or paris these are newer cities that have come up in our our memories in recent history and um, as they came up to be really strong economic powerhouses and have strong property um markets and have strong kind of retail markets as well you know you think about the luxury shopping the jewelry that you can buy in places like the middle east in dubai um in you know in singapore um as these cities were being built there was a very strong understanding that to draw in the people who they would need the kind of manpower the people to populate these cities to create the marketplaces that they would need to have a very strong draw for that and culture is one of those strong draws um and culture has become a very important component of the global alpha city in developing you know this kind of like really contemporary major cities um mm -hmm. in developing strong economic centers um and in culture of course there's a historic element to it but people are very keen on contemporary art and i think that when you mm -hmm. look at the emerging global alpha cities like get i'm going to point really quickly at dubai or at singapore their mm. art and their culture is more recent and they have a heavy emphasis on no that's incorrect for me to say they have a very long history of culture but in terms mm. of what um what is being shown and projected for the purposes of city building a lot of it mm. is very heavily leaning on contemporary art production contemporary i think you are you are talking the european right no in terms of no no even in if you're thinking about like singapore or dubai you know mm. dubai has come up really strongly the middle east abu dhabi mm. you know sharjah mm. they have the annales mm. they've got you know you think about how quickly dubai has developed since the late 90s early 2000s and mm. the idea of the flux of culture if you look at the development of saudi arabia currently um as they're kind of expanding and opening up they're really kind of mm. using culture as a big driving force you know um and opening those markets and finding an alternative to let's say with Saudi Arabia to oil based an oil based economy finding other ways to transition they find the introduction of culture through um mm -hmm. public art projects through major museums through hosting exhibitions or biennales is a real draw for people to turn their eyes to that place and say okay well what's happening here how can we engage with them you know on a smaller scale as well it drives tourism it makes cities much more livable so art don't you think a huge mm. measured impact positive impact on um the development of marketplaces don't you think uh, we are aligning with singapore too because uh, in terms of cultural development uh, we are very much the same don't you think so if you say okay they have a more developed market and then uh, we as well so why we are not really working out in this aspect especially come to the art market I mean we are working out definitely but it's still not as prominent as what the uh, what yeah. is Singapore doing. Yeah. You know that that's a really interesting question um and mm. it's something I actually think about a lot in my practice because mm. um disclaimer I am a Singaporean. But I've lived in Malaysia <laughs> since the mid 90s since I was a child. <laughs> okay, okay. Um and I think I love both places equally. In Singapore they have a very strong push from the institutions. When I say mm. the institutions, I mean the museums. So you've got National uh, Gallery Singapore, mm. beautiful building. Then you've got um, Singapore Art Museum, which is kind of it's been closed for renovation. It's been reworked. You've got mm. you know a few museums. You've got uh, cultural campuses. Um, you mm. have corporates coming in heavily to support for the development mm. of the Singapore Biennale. Basically, there's been a mobilization of a support structure, which I mm. think is really important. In Malaysia, we have a really, really wonderful critically engaged um contemporary art movement it's recognized as one of the strongest emerging contemporary art movements in the world today um mm -hmm. look, our artists do very very well they're very mm -hmm. heavily privately collected um but you know the market is emerging and markets emerge at different points 
um, and in different ways. I think the market in Malaysia is emerging much more through the development and support of more private-led initiatives. If I look at the mm -hmm. AFK collection, for example, which is the most important collection of first-generation Malaysian contemporary art in the world today, and it mm. puts down it puts down the narrative for the history of Malaysian contemporary art from mm -hmm. the first generation through the current practices. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, okay. Um, um, that, that, that's Zena. Yeah. Zena, when you mentioned about integrating with the city, because you mentioned those are the things, uh, those are the art value, put it in the city. And uh, um, I have uh, just come across in my mind, how are in the public, Rian can integrate city data to help disseminate the information embedded within it and provide urban opportunity for knowledge exchange nowadays. And art and creative practices in the public spaces as places of the knowledge exchange may enable more sustainable communities and city through the visualization of data. So artists to understand their approaches to creativity, data, and education. So we study how they educate and dialogue with the community about the sustainable issues. So specifically, how can we use artworks in the art of public spaces as a means of as a means for sustainability knowledge exchange in the city? Um, you know, I think that's really interesting. And that's a that's again, that's a macro question, which is great. And I think a lot of times when we pose these questions to artists, we give them a macro question mm -hmm. and then we encourage them or at least hope and try to encourage them to investigate those questions through the specific um, facets of their own artistic practice. Um, and sustainability, of course, has so many uh, meanings to it. You know, there's economic sustainability, there's environmental sustainability, there's social sustainability, there's human sustainability, there's knowledge sustainability. Um, and I think that artists kind of approach, I think that artists use public art, can use public art projects to find a way to make knowledge more available. And once you make knowledge more available, it creates a sustainability for that branch of knowledge. Um, you know, I recently wrote about the practice of a very important Pakistani contemporary artist. Mm -hmm. His name is Ron Qureshi. Um, and he's, you know, he's collected the world over, not just in Pakistan, he's got a big name everywhere. And he did this project for the Lahore Biennale a couple of years back, and it was called the Maktab School of Miniature Painting. And um, he, a lot of Pakistani artists, contemporary artists are trained in miniature painting. And he studied at the National College of Arts where he's also taught. Mm -hmm. And um, the, he had made an installation for the Biennale, but it was in the old Lahore Fort, which is a historic building. Um, and he wanted to draw attention to the history of the fort, to the way the public spaces in the fort had historically been used, and were being engaged with by the public today, which is important because we're thinking about a historic building. How do we preserve these buildings instead of you know breaking everything down and like kind of building skyscrapers, right? Um, so kind of mm -hmm. drawing attention to the history of that building, I felt was important. Um, mm -hmm. The history of miniature painting you wanted to think about. So we set up an itinerant school in the courtyard space of the fort, where students mm -hmm. from the National College of Arts were invited to sit and paint their miniatures and it was a painting studio as you would have in an art school in an external space during the Biennale. And visitors to the Biennale would walk around and they would come across this school of miniature painting, the Maktab, and, um, and they would see them. And of course, then questions would naturally arise. In my mind, that was a very successful project um, and he's been invited to um, give it subsequent lives in uh, the UK and I'm sure in other places as well. We'll invite him. Um, because that project for me brought together several branches of knowledge. One was uh, an art history knowledge, an art history that drives contemporary Pakistani art and knowledge, as we all know, is a really important part of the art market. Second was drawing attention to this really important historical space, which, as I said, I think thinking about the histories of spaces and what they mean is important as we move forward. You know, when we're developing cities, we have to think about what to keep and what to not keep and to build over etc and this is historic it's also the, co it's also the community base am i right and it's, it's also community based it's the community of the artists the students the students mm. with the professors the students with imran um students mm. of the biennale and the students mm. with the community at large which is the city of mm. lahore 
and the visitors to the Lahore Biennale. So the entire community is coming together and engaging and they're getting several facets of knowledge out of it. And I found that really interesting. Um, and to my mind, that's an example of a successful uh, cultural, uh, successful um, public art project. How can community, uh, how can community based art contribute to a creative art collection and dissemination for advancing sustainability in the city? I think that there's, again, there's many ways to look at that. Um, you know, community-based art, I, I think that, at least in my practice, a lot of the work that I look at is, you know, when artists are doing something that's community-based, it's them making mm -hmm. something that speaks to the wider community, reaches out to them, um, and involves their thoughts in the production of the artwork. And that can be within a single artwork, if I think of a, mixed media work by the Malaysian painter Fadli Yusuf he made called it's titled 33 Bila Malaysia 50 and he turned 33 in the year of Malaysia's 50th independence and he was thinking about himself as an individual and he was thinking about what does it mean to be Malaysian and he realized that to be Malaysian is not just him himself as a lone person it's not the individual it's a community of Malaysians and he wrote a series of questions on pieces of paper and he would go to public areas like, um, and he's from Kelantan, so he went there, but he went around the country, around KL to public areas, you know, malls, shops, like outside restaurants. And he would stop people and give them this questionnaire to talk about what it meant to them to be Malaysian. And they would write down in Kelantanese dialects, in Malay, in English, in Chinese, in Tamil. And he made a, he made a self portrait and he papered the background of it with these, um, with these answers. Um, and I thought that was extremely interesting because again, it's, it's the it, he's drawn on the collective to make a single work, and that in the in that work a lot of knowledge is housed. It's not just himself and his observations. He's in a very thoughtful manner engaged Malaysian public, the community, to come together and encourage them to think about. You know, if I stop and ask you, what does it mean to be Malaysian? You know, what does it mean to be uh, Malaysian in twenty twenty two? It's it's a deep question, and you'd stop and think about it. To ask somebody what does it mean to be Malaysian in the fiftieth year of independence, it's it's a really deep mm -hmm. question. If somebody asks you that, you stop and you really consider it. I think it has an impact on the way you move forward because you think, okay, well, this is what I think about it is to be a Malaysian. How should I then engage with my world? Um, and sometimes another way artists, I think, do community projects that kind of encourage sustainability is by making us think about the world around us and how it's changed. Um, I'd like to actually reference another Malaysian contemporary work in this point called uh, Kadai Runchit Number no. 12 by Shushi Lawati mm. Suleiman, who is known as mm. Shushi. She's an extremely important Malaysian contemporary artist um, who's currently actually living and working between kind of Tokyo and uh, Malaysia. Um, but at this point in 2012, at the Art Stage Fair in Singapore, she was invited to take over an entire booth and pr produce an installation. And she made um, she made a makeshift kadai runchit, mm -hmm, you know, like mm -hmm. sunrise shops. Yeah, yeah. Which you see anymore? Like, I mean, they were still around, and I think you're in my childhood, Stephen. But you know, I don't think my you don't get that. You don't get that anymore nowadays. This is you know. I think I asked my like, you know what? I miss that actually when I was young. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Zena. <laughs> Zena, you made. Uh, sorry, so Zena, this is. You community yeah. element was that mm. she she actually made the kadai runchit and it was full of the wares you would find in a kadai runchit mm. and the community would come in and shop there and it was very exciting um for people either who remembered it and couldn't find kadai runchits it's or also become people. a movement yeah yes exactly and, and, and it makes you ask the question what was our landscape like what is our landscape like now why has it changed yeah. what exactly. are the positives what are the negatives what do we want to take forward so there's a lot of kind of community um prompting of community thinking within these within these projects. Okay, Zena, you mentioned quite a few projects just now, some of the works were done by uh, uh, different artists. What are the mm -hmm. overlaps between the projects, the artwork intended impacts, and the 17 United Nations Sustainable Development Goal, which is the SDG? So actually, you can talk about the work you have staged, the exhibition the last time, which is Art Testing, the foundation. Yes. Um, so... Again, as I said earlier, just just really quickly before we delve into that, I just wanted to touch back on that idea of mm. which is in which is in our title. You know, the effect of showing art in the public realm on art market sustainability. So there's just to break that down into two things. One, the public realm is um, we immediately mm. think of that as a museum or like a public 
kind of space where you'd have like a like mm -hmm. an amphitheater. But the public realm is actually anywhere where art can be seen publicly. So it extends mm -hmm. to galleries, etc. Um, and the second is art market sustainability. Sustainability, as I mentioned earlier, is not just environmental, it's economic, human, social, historical, you know, knowledge driven as well. So many facets to that. So the project that my um, I did with Dua, Dua Consultancy, my uh, art consultancy mm -hmm. with my partner, Leila Khan, mm -hmm. we did a project called Artastic, the foundation. Mm -hmm. And the aim of this project um, was to start creating a sustainable uh, secondary art marketplace for Malaysian contemporary art. So when I studied the Malaysian contemporary art landscape, I felt that was something that was missing. Um, a very strong public facing secondary art market. Mm -hmm. So we partnered with Saim Dabi Property and CIMB Islamic and mm -hmm. um, we produced an exhibition of 22, 25, sorry, um, important Malaysian contemporary artworks drawn from the secondary mm -hmm. market which means it already had at least one transaction. This was subsequent transactions. So I, I, I took them from private art collections mostly. Um, mm. And we over a showroom of Saim Darby's in Subang Jaya, their SJCC showroom. And we made the inside of it into an art gallery. And we put up mm. these important Malaysian historical artworks. And, um, we didn't just happen to put up some random works. We actually curated them so that when you walked through the exhibition, you were being led through Malaysian contemporary art history, a snapshot mm. of it. From the development of the movement through the current practices, current times, through a selection of genres, um, mixed media, contemporary calligraphy, figurative art, um, the Matahati, etc. Mm -hmm. And we had a selection of important artists whose practices had really impacted the development of Malaysian contemporary art, such as mm -hmm. Fawzah Kumar, Ahmad Shukri, and Kui Chu, Palmer Shoei. Yeah. Um, all, so all those great artists in Malaysia, wonderful, yeah. So wonderful excited. people, yeah. Yeah, wonderful people, yeah. I met them, in fact, yes. Yes, no, you have. You have such an interest in art, and you know, um, <laughs> Chun Wei, favorite artist yeah. of mine, I love. Uh, yeah, okay. and, uh, if, uh, and also uh, Chun Wei, you know. Choi Chun Wei yes. is our, our good friend. <laughs> Chun Wei, if you are if you are tuning in, thank you very much because I told you you had to tune in, Chun Wei. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you okay. Can. All right, uh, Zina, let's change a little perspective to look at the issue. Artists feel positively towards art's ability to create reflection on environmental concern in society. What is the main motivation for artists working with environmental art, according to your understanding? Hmm. The, the main motivation, I think, for artists working in environmental art is a concern with the world around them and mm. the impact our actions have on the world around us um, mm. from an environmental perspective. Um, and sometimes that's something that they think about because of their own connection to the world around them. If I look at Fawzan Omar, a very senior Malaysian contemporary artist, I would call him practically the father of the contemporary movement, one of the first contemporary artists, very strong mixed media uh, practice. He made a series in the 90s, the 1990s, called the Reef Series, and it's a stunning series. Um, and it's all kind of cut canvas and laid up and built up in a reconstructive process to look at um, the idea of reefs, which is, you know, reefs, corals around Malaysia. I find it very interesting. He was thinking about this in the 1990s because he's born, you know, in the 50s, and he grew up through that period of rapid development of Malaysia. And mm -hmm. as he's looking at the world around him developing, you know, Malaysian physical landscapes are changing. And he's not saying this is a negative thing, but he's asking the question: How through the reef series, how do we develop sustainability? Because I'm seeing my city change, I'm seeing my physical landscape change, I'm seeing my world change, and I think it's great. It's changing, and we're advancing. But how do we do it in a meaningful way, in a thoughtful way, so it's sustainable and there isn't a negative impact to the beautiful Malaysian landscape, the reefs, the world around us? Because he understood, even in the 90s, if we weren't do developing thoughtfully, mm -hmm. you know, what he sees will change. Sometimes for these artists, it comes this understanding of the environmental, uh, the importance of the environment of the world around us comes from something external. If I think of the... Malaysian contemporary artist Noor Tijan, who's a female um, mm -hmm. artist, artist and sculptor, she um, she graduated, you know, from UITM, did her degree, did her masters, and she had four young children. She has four young children, 
she's a mid-career artist, and um, she realized when she had her kids how much stuff she was accumulating and how much mm-hmm. stuff is advertised at kids. And it's all throwaway things, you know, plastic toys that break or, you know, a high chair that every time you have a new baby, you're told to buy a new high chair. And she was like, oh, my God, I've got all this stuff. And then what do I do with it? Then you throw it away. And then there's just land, you know, landfills filling up. So as a mother, she suddenly had this epiphany and she makes these amazing wall assemblages out of um, collected uh, collected waste, um, e-waste, electronic waste. Because she was saying one of the things is, you know, like kids' toys that have electronic components, computers, handphones, what do we do with them? You know, we just, we use them. You know, Apple's giving us a new iPhone every, you know, year or two years and we're like chucking away the iphone 11 which i feel just came out and suddenly we're all running to buy the iphone 14 but your iphone 11 is still working so how do artists um zina do artists think that environmental art can contribute to sustainable development i don't think i can speak for all the artists (laughs) i know that i'm just being skeptical now actually Um, no, I, 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 think, I, think, I, think, I think that they, I think that they definitely do think and hope it can because mm, mm. You know, when you shine a light on an issue, you're encouraging people to think about that issue. Mm, and the mm. thing that really well-made contemporary art does is it encourages people to think in a critical manner. It creates a space for thinking. You know, it's not an mm. artist saying, like with Norti Jan with her electronic waste works, you know, she's not saying, mm. don't buy the iPhone 14 and use your old phone. She's saying, you know, here's something to think about. You know, she's opening a conversation. You're looking at those works. You're thinking about how you handle certain things. And you're um, you're considering your own actions. And the thing with the environment that I find interesting, just not even in art terms, but in broader terms, is that all of us impact the environment. You know, each and every one of us. And to differing degrees. And we're seeing now, you know, like Pakistan, for example, recently had the massive flooding. I mean, mm. which has been and traumatic and they were saying uh-huh. that a lot of the countries that contribute the least to global warming and Pakistan is not a huge contributor apparently there's articles mm, on this yeah. um, are impacted because of the actions of other countries that do a lot of activity that contribute you know western countries etc and um, and we realize that for all of us our actions have an impact mm. I think that's what the artists are encouraging us to think about the courage us encouraging us to think about our actions and the impact that has on the world around us um, so I think yeah, that they do oh, mm. positively. Yeah, the fact that artists often operate from a different paradigms and ask questions that have been forgotten or ignore open up new connections and possibility to expand their understanding of sustainability issue. Yeah. In this context, exhibition and plastic works like based on sculpture, paintings, artistic notebook were highlighted as powerful spaces where people could reassess their views on sustainability issue by popping up some questions, for instance. So, Zena, what is the role of the attitude within sustainability market and the arts in facilitating or even hindering collaboration? When you say collaboration, could you maybe expand what you mean a little bit? Like, do you mean... Collaboration between communities and and the environment. Parties, it can be co-creation. The context, it doesn't yeah. it doesn't has to be a uh, artist individual its own. Because uh, yeah. if you look at how artists practice, they are usually quite individualistic. So yeah. uh, I think this is what I like to see. You 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 have mentioned about the changes we evolve. Even creative landscape has changed as well. Not the same like in the past uh, in the past 20 years or even today. Uh, especially later on we will talk about some other things that uh, uh, relate to digital art. So uh, yeah. So I'm not sure what do you think uh, as a curator yourself? I think that I don't I think that it I think that that's I think that this question has to be answered on a really case by case basis. Mm-hmm. Probably, I put it this way. Okay, I put it this another way to look at it: how to work with tensions emerging in collaboration across paradigms and timelines, especially. Okay. Um, the, okay, I get what you mean now. Um, I think that again, it goes down into. In you know, it's like any group project in a way. You know, mm-hmm. like you think about what are the motivations behind mm-hmm. the brief that you're given. 
you know, the brief could be the production of an artwork, the brief could be mm -hmm. to shine a light on something, on, on an issue, on the spotlight. Um, and I think that in anything, you know, when you work as a curator with an artist and then you have an audience, for example, that's three viewpoints mm. there. Um, and so you have to think about kind of how do you give um, value and weight to everybody's viewpoint? How are you bringing across the most meaningful parts of everybody's viewpoint? And I think that the biggest thing, the biggest way to do that is just really open and honest communication and dialogue. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. Constantly be discussing things. I find a lot of times. I think my. I think I work quite well collaboratively, and I think that's because <laughs> you know, Stephen, I'm super chatty. I love to talk. To you. I'm super curious. Um, yeah. <laughs> because, you know, when you when you talk a lot to someone about something, um, you really begin to understand because you're having the conversation so many times. You're understanding it from kind of all the facets of their viewpoint and you're putting forth all the facets of your viewpoint and from that kind of areas of um cohesion will emerge or even when there's areas of tension you'll figure out how to um navigate those you know really thoughtfully because i think that that's what we need for things to be sustainable i think we need to be thoughtful mm. and collaborative and positive you know and how, do, how to deal with the power dynamics and difficulties of integration Mm, how to deal with the power dynamics and difficulties of integration. Mm. Again, like I think for me, that comes back to kind of picking out as a curator, how I work at least. Mm -hmm. um, I can't speak for any everyone, but I think for me, the most important thing is kind of taking a step back and studying kind of what are the key highlights, you know, in a, mm -hmm. in a project or in a, in a piece of art or in a, you know, in a community. And mm -hmm. what are the most important ways to communicate, or most effective ways to communicate that through the work that's being done? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and when you can bring that out, then I think you can kind of negate the power, the power struggle that happens when everybody's working mm -hmm. together cohesively. You know, mm -hmm. I think we have to. I've seen, seen that. In fact, I've seen that. I've yeah. seen that quite obvious, especially. In Malaysia, you know, it's so surprisingly when I return to Malaysia, I see the way how artists work. You know, I see all these issues. So, uh, of course, I can feel that, especially you have you, when you are in the professional industry, like in the European market. So you can mm -hmm. see that that kind of like inter, uh, integration. You they have this kind of rep, uh, which is uh, how they deal with each other. But uh, when you come back to Malaysia, especially in Southeast Asian region, this part of the world, and it, it looks very odd. And uh, they're still having this kind of integration, but even more. But although it's not like so-called, they are a full-blown professional industry yet. And now it's kind of amateur. People do it like freelance or that kind of... But they're still having that kind of context. You know? So I find that it's a bit odd. No, no. I, Where I does do, it I, actually I, come from? You know? I, I do have to say that, like, I mean... While the market is emerging and support oh, no. structures are still emerging, no. when I say support okay. structures, museums, you know, we've got to develop a better museum mm, structure. Okay, we've got okay. To the, auction houses. the the artists themselves, I have always oh, yeah. found to be consummate professionals, you know, mm, and mm. I do find that historically and even in the contemporary sense, there mm. there's a lot of camaraderie amongst them, and there's a lot of mm. kind of so there's a big thirst for knowledge. There's a thirst to get knowledge out there. You know, um, we've got a great history of artist collectives. Mm -hmm. I find the artists themselves extremely, extremely professional and really able. I've learned a lot about working collaboratively through those projects. You know, and if mm -hmm. we think of the artist collectives that have historically existed, I'm going to name three really quickly. Umpat Percepci from the late 80s, early 90s. Uh, yes, 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 yes. Yeah, right. You know, um, who are amazing and have had such an impact. And currently right now, I'm very interested in a young, young mid-career artist collective called the Ara Damansara group. So it's the mm. seven of them. And um, and I work with them, uh, you know, I do some research, et cetera. I've shown a couple of them in my shows and mm. they have, there's no sense of competition. It's with them, it's everybody's got an individual practice. Mm. Everybody's got thing they're thinking about and they're really keen to kind of give support. There's no kind of formal conception like what the group's kind of aesthetics maybe are, mm. but it's, it's basically they're banded together all of these collectives banded mm -hmm. together by a desire to you know share knowledge spread knowledge you know um find ways to work give each other practical and moral support um you know come together for discussions and again you know i go back to that idea you know in art it's knowledge sharing it's talking about things mm -hmm. it's, you know, 
Exactly, yeah. exactly. Does the concept does the concept of sustainability stand in the way of more productive collaborations? Uh, no, you know, I think sometimes people think that, oh, if I have to think, uh, I don't think so, not in Malaysia. Because I, I find it's quite interesting to me that Malaysians quite naturally have always thought about things quite sustain sustainably. And I think that's because when you look at the kind of culture of the local Malaysians, mm. there's a lot mm. of uh, elements in it that are very natural, mm -hmm. um, very nature-based. You know, like um, it was explained to me again by Shushi Suleiman that the mm. Mal gardens look wild, but they're not. They're planted in a certain way. The flowers are in a certain place. The herbs are in a certain place. There's an order to it. You know, it's been arranged. And um, so there's always this kind of connection back to Mother Earth and back to thinking about the Earth that has always been in the artworks um, or in the artist practices or in their minds, at least. So I think here, and I find like not even in art, just you know, in, in conversations, people here are concerned with, um, you know, green architecture, you know, with um, mm. how to make things more sustainable because our city is growing so quickly, Kuala Lumpur. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, we're seeing... Like, yeah, we, we're also been having flooding the last couple of years. Um, and people are thinking, like, how do I make things productive? I don't think people, at least here, which is the context I feel like I can speak in with um, confidence, the Malaysian context, um, I don't think people think of it as, as a barrier to achieving um, goals or projects. Mm -hmm. I think rather they think, okay, I want to achieve this goal, this end result. Mm -hmm. I also want my life or my world to look a certain way what are the steps that can take to make sure things are sustainable or environmental fr environmentally friendly to then achieve this end goal? How do I get there? And I think that's a sign of actually a really mature-minded market. Okay, um, um, Zina, you mentioned about culture. In furtherance of the mention, as our culture takes on social responsibility and action, creative fields such as architecture, you mentioned about their early on, sculpture and other various art forms have followed suit. Artists looking to join in on the current conversations surrounding sustainability are using their work to send a message either by its theme or the media used to create the piece. So what does sustainability mean for the art world uh, throughout your experience, throughout so many years of art curating work, and also how sustainability inspires social consciousness. <clears throat> I really like what you said just now about how artists are thinking about sustainability through two route routes. One is through the material they use, which is the medium and the technical, mm -hmm. and the second is through the conversation they're having, which is the concept and the philosophical. Mm -hmm. And I think that both have an important weight in the way artists are um, working. Um, mm -hmm. And I find what's really exciting is when an artist makes a work either that either through medium or through concept has a longevity that's mm -hmm. perhaps past even what the artists themselves could have imagined. And I think that that happens when the work is made from a place of genuine truth, um, something the artist has really observed and questioned and thought about. I'd like to think about a series by Ahmad Shukri from the early 2000s, and it's called the Virus Series. Yeah. And I remember in 2020 when we went into global lockdown, and I was, I was actually, I got stuck in London during the lockdown for five months <laughs> um, because I didn't think that there was going to be a pandemic, and I left for London to um, to see the Warhol exhibition to go to the launch of the Warhol. Oh, that's the nice. Time. And the world, yeah, yeah, but it was a week before lockdown, and then suddenly the world locked out. I'm a like, big fan of Andy Warhol works. Uh. It was well, it, I mean, it was worth it. It was worth being locked out in London for five months for that show. <laughs> but I, I remember looking at this at this series um, of Ahmad Chikris because you know you have time. What do you do? So I was doing a lot of research, mm -hmm. um, and he's talking about the way the world was becoming increasingly global. I'm just thinking about this almost 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. Way the world was becoming increasingly global. Um, how things mm -hmm. were becoming borderless, um, you know, migration of thoughts and ideas and exchanges and animals and, you know, all of that, which is super positive. But he was mm -hmm. also saying, he was also looking at, I mean, the virus is something that has migrated. It's essentially a borderless thing as well. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I mean we've, we have literally lived through this pandemic, seeing how mm -hmm. it went. I mean, it spread like wildfire. 
I, you know, I, I, I could not have predicted that. I obviously did not predict that and I went overseas and got stuck. Mm. Um, but I found that project really, really interesting because he was asking about the flip side. And he's saying, as we are developing in this towards this utopia of borderless globalization, which is something that I think is great and we should totally aspire to, but um, with positives, there are always negatives. You know, there's always yin and yang, right? Like philosophy. So he's also mm. thinking about um, what was that impact? You know, what mm-hmm. are we thinking about all the things that could happen? Are we are we making sure we're doing this in a in a responsible way so that we mitigate negative outcomes? And um, and to kind of see almost twenty years later that question he posed come to life. I don't think that he would have ever imagined he was going to live through a pandemic. I don't think any of us did. You know. Um, and so works like that have a real sense of longevity. And I think that's what mm-hmm. makes it much more interesting. Um, and I think that, again, as I said, it happens when it comes from a place of real genuine truth. Okay, uh, Zena, let's take along with, uh, with that. Sustainability uh, issues are identified by the artists and extended through an art-based approach. Collaborative work practices aim at making an impact on public, gallery mm-hmm. and museum visitors. Understanding and sharpening their their awareness and environmental, cultural, economic, and social issues. So, what kind of artistic activities and awareness have the potential of opening up diverse understanding and experiences of sustainability among public, gallery, and museum guests? Oh my good gosh! I mean, I think there's there's a lot. You know, of course, there's the the simple thing of putting on an exhibition. I say simple, it's not that simple to put on an exhibition, but like, you know, the kind of first, the first way we would think about it is, let me put on an exhibition with works that perhaps think about this topic and maybe write about it, have some talks about it. Um, That's one way. I think another way to do it is through um, a way that I personally enjoy um, to learn about kind of really current topics really quickly is when I visit a show or see an artwork that's um, interactive or invites audience participation. This could be through um, asking the audience member to leave something Mm -hmm. behind. Some artworks do that. This could be through enveloping the audience in an environment. Like I'd said, uh, you know, Shushi Sunaman's Kandai Runchit, where the very, very collaborative between artists and artists and audience, because the artist had all the wares of a traditional Kadai Runchit. She had works by young, at that time, very young artists kind of hidden within the Kadai Runchit. Um, and mm. uh, the public came in and bought things. So it was, you know, the public was immersed. It was very interactive. I think works like that, I mean, um, and I think showing works that perhaps have several mediums or genres to them also kind of extends the ability for public interest and engagement, um, you know, uh, Shafiq Norden, who's part of the Aradam and Sara group I had just name-checked, mm. he just did an installation. It's come down now. It was in the lobby of uh, National Art Gallery Malaysia, and it was about the panic buying we, ex- we experienced during the pandemic, where he was like, oh, and it's based on gardenia loaves of bread. And he was like, he felt that for two years almost it was impossible to buy bread and, and other staples. And he made these large um, installations that rotated, and they were like, kind of more classic, there were sculptures and you engage them in a classic way. But on one wall, he had <coughs> digital um, NFTs available for sale. And that again, kind of drew in the question of um, how had our lives changed during the pandemic? You know, first of all, there was the immediate experience of panic buying, etc. But also he's thinking about, you know, the way we interacted with each other, the way we shopped, the way we did our daily activities really shifted in the pandemic. I mean. I had never even heard of Zoom until 2020, and now I use it all the time. You know. <laughs> okay, uh, Zena. No, uh, all the time. How and and how and why have the artists used artistic action in connection to values in their art exhibition and art education? When you say values, do you mean um, kind of moral values or social values or kind of financial economic values? Um, it could be anything. all together. All together. All together. Social, personal value, uh, moral value, economic value as well. Yes. 
Yeah. Um, you know, I'm actually going to refer back to your earlier statement and say that actually gives us an inroad into understanding how artists mm. use art to think about values in their practices. Mm. Mm. Um, and then it's through the two routes of um, technique, which can be medium or way of making. Mm. And the mm. second, which is concept. And they might do it through, you know, again, I'd, earlier I'd referenced Noor Tijan using e-waste. Um, mm -hmm. in her works and by using that me medium in her works she's actually asked us to think about the value of the waste and um, the kind mm -hmm. of environmental impact the kind of moral values of throwaway culture you know um, her medium has really inspired um, encourages us to think about that um, in other places it's through concept where artists are using their art to maybe make a a statement as we saw in again when I referenced Foz and Omar's Reef series, um, that work not so much through technique but through concept is encouraging us to think about the world around us and how we approach the development of the world around us to be sustainable, to be environmental friendly, to think about keeping it for future generations. Um, so I think that for artists, their art is, um, they're actually only limited by their own imagination. You know, and I think that through their experimentation, they can find such a wonderful, diverse array of ways to ask us those questions or, or to kind of pose those questions. <laughs> Zena, how has participatory art and participatory market influenced the artist's artistic action? That changes very much the world over. Um, here in Malaysia, uh, if I'm looking at participatory, I think that in terms of participatory art, what it has done is uh, kind of in a more traditional sense in the contemporary market is it's made, is it's created a set a uh, route for knowledge to be shared. So it's become just very, I'm going to have a sip of water because my mouth is dry. Hold on. <laughs> participatory market, yes. But participatory art has, um, I think okay. the kind of way it's, the strength in the Malaysian market is a way of sharing knowledge, of making mm -hmm. knowledge present, which is really interesting to me because kind of the strongest ways knowledge is shared in Malaysia traditionally has been through visual and oral means, you know, um, storytelling, you know, dances, um, art in all its forms, crafts. Um, and so we as a society, I think a lot of, a lot of society, you know, receives knowledge really well kind of through visual means. So participatory art kind of really quickly and immediately gets that information out to audiences. Um, mm -hmm. I think by participating in the market, um, it's really important for artists because that establishes prices and values. We only know what something costs when we are told what it costs. If I ask mm. you, how much does a exactly. war cost? Yes, you yes, exactly. You know, it's just, it's just like something. somebody control the market. Yes. Well, not control the market but you you need to have access to information to know things like you know if i ask you like you know the warhol sold earlier this year at christie's for 100 million us dollars mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. And, um, so now if i said you know, how much does a warhol cost you might reference that you might say well i saw the christie's auction short sage mm -hmm. blues maryland sold for 100 million or you might say you might i went to the gallery yeah. and i saw warhol for for 500,000 us dollars so your point of reference because there's a market and the works are available to you in the market Mm. So by, by participating in the market and making the works available, you're you're then telling people what things cost. Mm. Even back then in the 90s, right? In the early 90s, like uh, Vincent Van Gogh, and one of his works also sold about two two millions actually in the early 90s. So you, yeah. you can see that, you know, that kind of price tag is amazing. So who decided the price tag? So uh, it's just like, I think what I mean by control, you know, you know, it has to be come from somebody like kind of like all this financial giant, you know, behind the, all the game, you know, they decided all this, how much is it worth? You know, and of, of course, you need to go to auction. People are like, all this auction, right? It's also, it's a game. You know, somebody has to like, a few people go in there to just like compete with each other. Then they will, they know that those are the world, right? Who will be, taken home you know in the end so i mean for me it's just like it's a kind of game and also someone control definitely, definitely yeah. in the auction market there, there is an mm. essence of you know the game or the gambling which makes it fun for people yeah. i think um but but i do want to be clear that art is an asset like any other asset market it has an intrinsic mm. value 
for example, mm. like property, you know, it's supply and demand. Um, and oh, yeah. art, I always, well, the interesting thing with art is art is actually a finite resource. Mm. An artist can only produce so many works. And within mm -hmm. those works, some are A grade, some are B grade, some are C grade. It's like, you know, a diamond, you know, you go to a mine, you mine diamonds. Some are mm -hmm. flawless, some have inclusion, some have, yeah. <laughs> so we have a whole range. And so you go into, um, go into the artist practice and you start, you can start uh, mm -hmm. and putting that down. And then like any other market, there's a, there's a functioning system. Like I can't go and say, give me $3 billion for this yeah, yeah. Like nobody's going to give me that. You know, you can't just make stuff up. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh Right, Zina. Let's. Uh, right, I think it's a uh, time to uh, for open for Q and A. Right, I think Great. it's a time to take a look at the question posted by the audience. Let's look at the questions. Uh, we have one questions. Um, let me see. Look at the questions. Okay. Uh, we have one questions here for my colleagues, Daniel. Uh, what would you say is the most effective approach? to de uh, democratize access to art, specifically for new art scenes outside traditional European markets? Um, you know, I think that's a really great um, question. And I like that you've asked about access to art. So I always think access is such an important kind of currency in the art world, um, Daniel. So um, I'd say the most effective mm -hmm. approach to democratize access to art in emerging markets is to show the art. You know, um, that's... It sounds so obvious, mm -hmm. but like giving people access to seeing art is so important because it's only by seeing the art that again, like I said earlier, you know, I'll only know what something costs if you tell me what it costs. I'll only know what the art is if you show yeah. me the art, you know? Um, and we need more spaces to see really great art in Malaysia. Um, that's again, like, you know, with Dua Consultasi, that was one of the reasons why we were so passionate about our project, Artastic the Foundation, because we got really stunning works and we put them in a space where, and because it was an alternative space, it was a property showroom that was open to the public that a lot of people went to. Um, so we had our audience, we had our kind of group of people, our connections, who we told about the show. But there were people who were going to the showroom anyway to look at property and they were like, oh my God, what's this? Um, I do, with the collection, we do a, um, like a public space hanging. Um, if you go to Bangsar Shopping Center, at the back, there's Manara BRDB, the office blocks with the two banks in the lobbies, um, Al Raji, Islamic Bank, and RHB. And in that lobby space, the AFK collection does a loan um, important artworks and they're up in the lobby. And currently we've got a beautiful, really large, really important Zulkifli Yusuf um, from the Raja Maimuna series. We have an Ahmad Fawad Osman from uh, his Korean series, Fatima Morgana. We have two beautiful works by Chin Kong Yi, the wonderful Chinese Malaysian painter who makes these like kind of evolving fish eye scenes, really wonderful landscape paintings. Um, and so for us, I mean, for me, and I think for a lot of the projects that I do at least, um, the best way to dem democratize access to art is to show it and show it in spaces that, you know, the public is perhaps already going to um, and giving them the opportunity to engage with the artworks, you know? Um, and another way I think is to write about art, you know? Um, exactly. Um, I can't believe our time is flying so fast. But I do have one <laughs> last question for you, Zena. It's about the benefit and risk of digital art. So let's slightly change the tune. The digitization of the art market is therefore already a challenge in itself. Yes. With the, with the eruption of NFTs, which is non-fungible token, is our digital life. Programs designed to enhance the sustainability of practice must be further strengthened and their application accelerated. Yeah. So how has the global art market responded to imposing digital assets? Um, wow, you know, it's such an, it's such an exciting question you've asked me because it's like <laughs> our talk on that is like, boom, right? Um, I, <laughs> I think that we had, you know, it's the, I would say it's the contemporary art market. So the way we approach the art has to be contemporary. That doesn't mean we have to like give up on, you know, bricks and mortar spaces and physical works. But I think kind of thinking about how we involve digi the digital, we involve digitization, et cetera, into, um, into art production, um, collection, it's, and the way we make it accessible, like showing, you know, exhibiting it is very important. And I think that, 
I think the pandemic kind of sped that up a little bit. You know, people got really excited by the digital. So of course, immediately we were like, oh, let's look at digital art. Like, what's that yeah. about? Um, mm-hmm. I think that that now that we're kind of taking a step back and slowing down, we're actually understanding there are questions we have to ask and answer to be, I mean, and I think a big theme for both you and me today has been this idea of sustainability, about being thoughtful, you know, in our actions exactly. and the mm-hmm. impact our actions have. You know, like mm-hmm. NFT, we think, oh, um, things that are digital have no kind of, they don't use paper and therefore they're so environmentally mm-hmm. friendly. And actually that's not true. You know, with NFTs, there's a lot of, um, because they have to be mined. And I'm sure okay. you know this. Yeah, yeah, so there's an environmental <laughs> impact on the mining yeah. that impacts us. It takes, exactly. you know, I think, like 4.5 days mm. of one household's electricity mm. used to mine, mm. a, mine not a very large amount of NFTs. Mm. So, you know, there's an impact there. So, again, I think it's about thinking what is the best use of this technology here. Um, but I think there's also a real benefit to digitizing art, you know. Um, if you digitize... You know, blockchains have created, um, you know, provenance. Yeah, provenance is something we think about in the art world. And if you think about blockchain, it creates kind of a unbreakable um, source of provenance. And I can know for a fact that the provenance of a work is correct by checking it on blockchain if it's been mm-hmm. digitized. So it's got really important practical applications <laughs> that we use in the art world. Zina, according to your understanding, moving mm-hmm. towards a more sustainable art environment, can NFT system be considered eco-friendly? Yeah, I think that they're already, um, I'm not an expert on this, so mm. I'm going to just preempt my question with that. But um, I know that they're already, because you see, once they've understood what the problems are, you know, that, okay, it's using this much energy, that's not sustainable long-term, you're able to then address the problem. Okay, how do we, what are the routes we can take to make this more sustainable? And I know that's a question they're already looking at, addressing, mm. Um, and given how quickly the technologies come up and developed, I think they'll be able to kind of find answers for that quite quickly. Um, and I think like you know, there's that idea that you can have a physical work and it can have an NFT counterpart. You can take a work that's physical, but it exists, its asset value exists as an NFT. Like there's so many ways to approach that. Um, because as you say, it's a non-fungible token. So it's basically an item that's attached to a token, which is the artwork whether it exists digitally or physically. I think, yes, also, uh, to continue to look at these prospects, um, yeah. I think there's a lot of uh, behavior different, especially the buying behavior. Uh, are clients dealing with crypto art and NFTs today? Oh, sorry, did you say are they? Yeah, yeah, people are, people are yeah. very um, enthusiastically purchasing crypto art and NFTs. Mm. You know, um, it, there, there's a huge marketplace for it, and I think it's really exciting. I think that it is still emerging; it is still new, um, mm-hmm. and I think I think a lot of people who are getting into it either have a very strong interest in digital art. Mm-hmm. This is my understanding, or a strong interest in kind of diversifying investments. <clears throat> so those are the two things I think that pe- pe- draw people. Traditional collectors do still quite like the idea of having physical works that they can. Yeah, put exactly. On. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm. You know, I be. I belong to that kind of category. Is I like to see things in physical. You know, <coughs> NFT. I don't. I can't see anything. You know, I'm not sure about. Is it really there? <laughs> you know. So I still yeah. have the kind of physical form. Yeah. yeah. No, because also, you know, I think it also depends a a on your own interest. When you're collecting art, it depends on your own interests yeah, as yeah. well. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and why you're buying art. You know, like um, for example, the AFK collection acquisition is done. Um, on the idea that it's a uh, it's a collection that has is telling a story of Malaysian contemporary mm. art. So within that, you have to have diverse voices, diverse genres, diverse mediums. So we would collect any any genre, any medium, whether it's digital or physical or you know ephemeral. Mm-hmm. Um, which is, but but buying it for a collection that has like a really strong narrative. Um, mm-hmm. If you're buying something, even as a collector for your home, and you're buying something that's digital and you can't show it. That's not fitting your needs. If you buy something for your whole, you need a painting, you need a sculpture. Print you know? out yourself. Print out. Print it out. <laughs> no, but that that's actually that's actually a really great point because there are ways around Print that. Out. Yeah, no, that, would, that, that be, would it be considered a plagiarism if I print out? 
you know, because I think that is a terms and condition you cannot print out. Am I right? If I print out, just only put it in my bedroom, would that be considered as violating this uh, copyright issue? This plagiarism? You have to look at the terms. <laughs> you know but, uh, but you know, like, I think, I mean, it's like getting a lovely print, you know, from a, you know, you go to a museum, you get a print. It's often licensed and, and it's got all those attached to it. But if yeah. you own the work and you wanted to print it out, I'm pretty sure you'd be able to. <laughs> okay, I, I think it is, it, it is no surprise that the art market has adapted the new to new and uh, unprecedented needs, especially yeah. during the COVID-19 era, the COVID yeah. era. Many yes. buyers and sellers have opted for online solutions, like what you just said, not only involving digital art, but also incorporating exhibition of artworks that would have been physically con uh, contemplated. Mm -hmm. Okay, Zena, this is a great thank you so much for giving us the time today for sharing all of your expertise so well thought out and it gave us a lot of think about as well it's likely spear some more questions so it wouldn't be surprised me if you and i may maybe met up again and have another conversation around some of these follow-up questions that i'm sure will be coming our way so awesome thank you so much once again zena i appreciate it thank you for being thank with you us so Thank you for having me, Stephen. I really enjoyed it. It was such a wonderful way to start my Saturday. And thank you for the questions. You know, you really made me think. Um, <laughs> and yeah, I think it's a really important conversation we're having about sustainability in the market and the many facets of sustainability that exist, you know? And I think it's great that we're all thinking about it. And about you know, the, Zena, uh, if you want to have a dialogue open out in the physical form, you always can roll me in with many other artists. That we can have a dialogue together. I would so, love to uh, do that. That's, that's <laughs> going to be in the future for sure. Thank you very much, okay. Adam. And have a okay, wonderful day. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Okay, thank you. Okay. Right. Okay. Uh, let's uh, tag along with this uh, digital art we just talked about earlier on with Zena. Um, with digital art being one of the cornerstone of the art market at present, new measures to protect... Uh, original digital art pieces come into force to disregard the fundamental role of NFTs. Digital art is becoming in an increasingly important part of the art market. I think everybody aware of that. It is a medium through which anyone can readily copy the original digital image or video and create an identical replica. Hence, the need of NFTs to allow artists to protect and market their original digital works. The explosion of NFTs in the market has enabled the buying and selling of digital art. So it's created a marketplace which did not previously exist. And millennials have poured into ride the zeitgeist wave and be the first to own some of the digital art and collect uh, and and the collectibles, and numerous benefits are associated with the NFT success. Part of the attraction has also been the fact that unlike analog art, digital art gives an artist more control over their creation, making it easier for them to monetize their work on resale, and it's likely to mean that NFT boom is only going to evolve rapidly to hyper-complex multimedia, multi-dimensional pixelated art page towards an increasingly digital society. Another prospect of the art market sustainability, I assume that. Right, my little quick thought and sharing here. With that Spotlight Dialogue series organized by Special Interest Group in Circular Economy at Integrated Sustainability and Urban Creativity Center from Asia Pacific University of Technology and Innovation APU. Till then, take care and each other. Have a nice weekend.